Our great Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is that we can gather here together, that we can separate ourselves from the world, that we can be together with those of like mind, Father, that we can enter into a period of worship with to you. Father, we pray that as we approach you, we might do all things according to your will, that we might be acceptable to you, that our worship might be acceptable to you. We ask you to forgive us of our sins, Father, so that we may stand before you in, in an approved manner, Father. And we pray, Father, that we might strive not to commit those sins, realizing the price that was paid for our sins, Father, a great price. And knowing that, Father, we might strive to follow your word, that we might not sin against you or against our fellow man. We're so thankful for Brother Smelser, who has come all this way, Father, to preach thy word to us, Father. It's a joy to know that Christians like him are all over this, all over this country and all over this world, Father, that we're not alone in this place, but we have brothers and sisters throughout the whole world. We take great comfort in that, Father, and we pray that we might always be attentive to one another's need. We might take care of each other where one is lacking that we might be able to fill in. And we pray, Father, that, that we might do so in the way you would have us to always. We pray, Father, for those who uh, would be here but are not because of some sort of sickness or injury or illness. Uh, we pray that you would use your healing hand to restore them to such a measure of health that would allow them to return to the work of the kingdom in the manner that they are accustomed, Father. And we pray for those elsewhere of, of thy number that are sick and pray for them, Father. And we're thankful for our good health, which allows us to be here. And we pray, Father, we might recognize that with the blessings that you've given us comes responsibility. And that we might fulfill our responsibilities to teach and preach thy word to a lost and dying world that we might have the love and concern that we need for those that we come in contact with, that we could so much as invite them to gospel meetings such as this, uh, hold Bible studies with them, or whatever we might do, Father, to show them the way. And we pray, Father, that even as, as this meeting this week, that as we're strengthened by what we hear, Father, we might be more determined to walk the straight and narrow way. We might not be distracted by the world, uh, who would have us walk the broad way, Father, for we know that, that those who walk the narrow way are the ones that are approved and will have an eternity with thee. And that's what we seek, Father, is to show ourselves approved here in this life that we might spend eternity with thee. Again, Father, we're thankful for this opportunity, for this church here which provides this opportunity, the elders which oversee it, and the deacons which serve it, and the members who support it, Father. We're thankful for all that, all that they do and the good examples that they set. We ask that you continue to be with us, Father, as we worship you through song and, and the lesson that we're about to hear, uh, that we would be better able to serve you in all facets of our lives and more determined, Father, to, to teach others to serve you. This is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I
more than a pleasure to be with you again. And for those who may be visiting from the community, we really, really appreciate the fact that you're here tonight and we want to present the word. And if you find that you have any questions or you'd like to look at the word any closer, just tell some of the brethren here that you'd be interested in, in looking to the word closer. And there's just a lot of fine people here that would be really pleased to get to know you and be pleased to be of service to you and be pleased to sit down and, and open up a Bible because everybody needs the Lord. We need his grace and we need to obey him as Lord. The grace from him being Savior and obey him as Lord. That's what we need. That's what you need. That's what we all need. And when we have that Bible open, it will speak to us both about his grace and about his teaching and guidance for us. So thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. And thank you. Uh, thank you, the elders, for the invitation to be here. Thank you as a whole for all you have done for us over the years. And it's, and it's a pleasure to be here again. I, I appreciate you very much. Tonight, the title, we're not going to have a PowerPoint tonight. Uh, there's not a three-minute Bible study on this one. So, and by the way, you may feel cheated on the last two lessons if you get online and find out that those things are only three minutes online and you had to listen to 35, 40 minutes of the sermon. But um, I talk fast online. Uh, this one isn't, so we won't have any illustrations on the board. But we're going to be talking about the materialistic fool. And that's a little bit of a misnomer. And let me show you why. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Everybody open up your Bible. And here is the misnomer. And you're not going to spot it as quick if you don't have your Bible open. So please open up your Bible. The actual title would be better to say the materialistic fools. Because there's two fools in this text. So open up your Bible and look at Luke chapter 12. And just scan over that for a minute and see if you can spot the two fools. Your heading at the top might say the rich fool, but he's not the only fool in this text. I'm going to give you a minute just to look over it and see if you spot the other one. It starts in Luke chapter 12, and it goes verse 13 through 21. Like I said, if you don't have your Bible open, you're missing this part of the lesson. I see a head nodding. Somebody spotted both of them. There's two materialistic fools in this section. In one of my Bibles, it says at the heading at the top, it says the rich fool. There's also a poor fool. You see him? Let's read the text together now. One of the multitude said to him, Teacher, bid my brother divide the inheritance with me. But he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed, keep yourselves from all covetousness. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. There's more than one type of covetousness. Jesus said, keep yourselves from all covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Have you ever seen the bumper sticker that said, he who dies with the most toys wins? Okay, that's the exact opposite of what Jesus is teaching here. And he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he reasoned within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have not where to bestow my fruits. He's got a problem. Suddenly, he's got more than he needs and more than he can, you know, put anywhere. Oh, no. What to do? Well, he comes up with something. And notice how focused on himself he is. What shall I do because I have not wherewith to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will bestow all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, 
Soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you foolish one, this night is your soul required of you, and the things which you have prepared, who shall they be? So is he that lays, lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So he's one of the fools. But did you notice the other one? The fellow that came and asked Jesus a question. Can you imagine what an honor it would be to get to speak to Jesus Christ? If you had five minutes to speak to Jesus, you can do it, we can speak to our God in prayer, but I mean on earth to walk up and have a conversation two-way where you could walk up and ask him a question and he'd talk back to you. What, what would you ask? If you could go back in time and be standing by the Sea of Galilee or wherever, and you got to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus. This fella got to do that. And you know what he chose to waste it on? Teacher, <laughs> tell my brother to give me some of his money. That's a fool. Fools, when it comes to materialism, Fools can come in two flavors, the haves and the have-nots. Why does Jesus tell a story about covetousness? It's right after this fellow asked the question, what does it mean to covet? You want what belongs to somebody else. Let's go back to the Ten Commandments. You got some pretty important commandments there. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know what the last one was? You shall not covet. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's donkey. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't, co don't covet your neighbor's stuff. And I'm going to tell you something. We've got two problems in this country today that have to do with covetousness and greed. And one is people that don't have what rich people have, and they're jealous and resentful of it. And the other is people who've got what they've got, and they're crazy about their riches, and they don't serve God, and they don't help, their peop help other people with it. Both of these are condemned in this text. So the greedy capitalist pig is condemned. And the guy that's jealous that there's some rich people in the world that have more money than other people, he's also condemned in this text. Jesus said, keep yourself from all covetousness. So now we're going to be looking at two, yay, three points. But we've already gone over the two big ones, and now let's talk about them. So fool number one, he says, tell him to give me the inheritance. If it's an inheritance, why does the brother have it? He inherited it. How many of you have seen families get really ugly when it comes to someone has died and there's a will? How many times have you seen that? Think about the person that died. If they knew how ugly and jealous and bitter the descendants were going to get, over who got what. They might have done what I, I saw a cartoon about years ago. Here's all the relatives lined up in front of the lawyer to read the will. And they're all ready to hear what they get. And he says, I so and so being as sound mind and body spent it all. <laughs> and and if, if some people knew what the people they loved did after they died, it would be shameful. This brother inherited something, and the other brother resents that. And let me tell you, we've got people in this country that play upon that very thing. And they want you to be jealous of the 1%. And they'll, you'll see news stories, and this fellow has this much money. That, that ball player has this much money. That CEO has this much money. It's not fair. It's not fair. We got to take their money, and we got to get it and, and give it to the other people. What did Jesus say here? Let's go back and read it. This fool 
with a chance to talk to the Messiah wastes it on being jealous of his brother's inheritance. Teacher, bid my brother divide the inheritance with me. Jesus said, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Take heed, keep yourself from all covetousness. I want to tell you a little bit about when I lived in Prague. There was something very interesting over there. Now, before I say this, I want to make this very clear. Christianity is not an American religion. Christianity is not a red, white, and blue flag. Christianity is not one political party or another political party. Nations like this are not Christian nations. This nation is a nation full of sinners, and Jesus, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and Jesus wants people in this country and in communist countries and in monarch countries and in dictatorships and in socialist countries and communist countries and whatever to deny themselves, humble themselves for God, take up their cross daily, and follow Jesus. So if you live in a socialist country, obey the laws, but serve God. If you live in a communist country, obey the laws, but serve God. If you live in a red state, obey the laws and serve God. If you live in a blue state, obey the laws and serve God. And if you live under a kingdom and you're a peasant, obey the laws and serve God. Christianity is not an American thing. It's not a political thing. Amen. Jesus said, pay taxes to Caesar, and that was taxation without representation. They didn't get to be citizens. They said, pay your taxes. They said, love God and love your neighbor. So the gospel of Christ is needed by people in any political system. And the teachings of Christ are to be followed by people under any political system. But having said that, I want to illustrate something about this type of covetousness. The type of covetousness that is created where you get the have-nots to be jealous of the haves. Look what they've got. You might think it would help everybody. So I want to tell you a couple stories after living in Prague. So after World War II... If you know your history, we liberated the western part of Europe, and the Soviet Union liberated the eastern part. And at Malta, they kind of divided it up, and Prague ended up under the part that the Soviets would get to liberate. And what the Soviets did, they installed communism in those countries. And when the Berlin Wall came down, I moved to Prague and started teaching over there. And y'all had fellowship with us in helping make that possible. And they had been under 40 years of this system. And the things got taken. The wealthy people, they had their stuff taken away. If you had a big, nice house, the communists would come in and say, you could live in that part of it. And we're putting another family here and another family here. And if you had a company, they could just take it. And everything belonged. They, they, some of those countries, they called it the People's Republic. But the people ends up being the government, and everybody then is kind of supposed to have kind of the same. Do you know what it produced? Jealousy. Jealousy. Like one Czech told me one time, he said, we were taught to resent anybody who had something we didn't have. That's exactly uh, an example of covetousness. Did you know in 1 Corinthians 5, where it's talking about withdraw from the man that's sleeping with his father's wife, it says, if any brother is a fornicator or a drunkard or an idolater or covetous, have nothing to do with it. Put them out. And it produced covetousness. There, are, I, I remember they told me one of the jokes over there. And it went like this. A genie 
came and offered one wish to an Englishman, a Frenchman, and a Russian. And he said, one wish, you can have whatever you want. And this, this is one of their jokes over there. The Englishman said, I want a country manor. Poof, he had a country manor. The Frenchman said, I would like a chateau with a vineyard. Poof, he had a chateau. Looked at the Russian, he said, what do you want? He said, my neighbor has a goat and I don't. Kill the goat. That's covetousness. Don't fall for that. The fact that somebody has more money than you doesn't mean they're evil, doesn't mean life's not fair, doesn't mean you deserve their money. It was a covetous fool that asked the question that started this parable. So you can be a have-not and you can be covetous. Some of the people that are lovers of money are the people that don't have it. There's a lot of people that don't have money that every week they're in there buying that lottery ticket. Buying the, they're complaining about the rich people, complaining about the rich people, and then they're playing that lottery. Why? They want to be the rich people. Don't fall for that jealousy. But there's another kind of fool. There's the haves that are greedy. And that's what Jesus tells about in the second one. What's missing in the second fellow's life? Has he prospered? Yeah, is it wrong to prosper? No. Did Abraham prosper? Yes. Did Job prosper? Yes. Did Zacchaeus prosper? Yes, it's not wrong to prosper. If you do it honestly, legitimately, if you don't put it ahead of God and you don't put it ahead of your family and you share with other people. But is that what this fellow does? No. In, this, in the description of what he's thinking, where does he think about anybody but himself? Look at the text. What will I do? This will I do. I will tear down my barns and build greater. There I will bestow my grain, my goods. I will say to my soul, soul, you have laid up goods for many years. Take your night, ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You remember the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man is faring sumptuously every day, dressed in purple. Where's Lazarus? Out there at the gate. He, he's not even able to walk. They have to lay him there. He's, his body is covered with sores. He would just like some crumbs. And there are needy people. There are needy people in this community. There are needy people in Birmingham. There's needy people in the world. There's needy people that would be greatly benefited. And what's it said to him? You fool. All this that you've got, it's not going to be yours. When I lived in Europe, every once in a while, I would rent a car, which was really cheap because every, everything was cheap. People didn't make much. A factory worker made $3 a day if you convert the crowns to, to dollars. A friend of mine, his father was a doctor. He made $150 a month. Uh, there was, I knew, met a computer pr programmer. Annual income, $1,500. Um, so I could rent a car for seven bucks a day. And one of the interesting places to go was over to South Germany, to Bavaria. And some of you will know this castle, Neuschwanstein. Does anybody know the castle Neuschwanstein? You've probably seen pictures of it. The, the, the castle at Disneyland, Disney World, that's loosely based on Neuschwanstein. It's one of the most beautiful castles in Europe. The guy that built it, King Ludwig, in the 1800s, I don't want to give too many details up for this for sake of time, but I'll try to do it quickly. He grew up in this like 1300s castle down there, but riding on horseback, he found this beautiful hill right here, looks down on his ancestral home. You look that way south, there's an Alp Lake and then the Granite Alps, snow-covered Alps. You look that way, just plains and fields and lakes and the sunset in the west. You look this way, and you're beside a wooded mountain with a 500-foot waterfall. And he decides this would be a good place for a castle, and he built a castle there. Magnificent. 
The throne room is gold and ivory. It's good. So on your phone afterwards, just look at a picture of Newsom's side. It's just fantastic. Then he built another castle. He bought an island, and he had a copy of Versailles built on that. And he built another castle. You know how long he got to stay at Neuschwanstein? I think it was 160-something days. The one on the island, it and another one, this is how much luxury he wanted. The dining room, the table, was set on a floor that could be lowered to the basement. So when it was time for him to eat, he didn't have to see a servant. They would crank the whole table down to the basement. They would set his rich, expensive food on there, crank the whole table back up to where he was, and he could eat without having to see any you know, low-life servants or anything. He got to spend nine days at that castle. And then his family had him committed for being crazy because he was spending all the money. And then he was on a walk with his doctor, his psychiatrist, one day, and then they were both found dead. Nobody knows exactly what happened, but they're just dead. Look at this here. You foolish one! This night your soul is required of you. These things which you have prepared, who shall they be? Now tourists get to see it. <laughs> you know, so, thousands and thousands of people get to go see this magnificent castle he got to spend nine days in. Look with me at Amos chapter 5. If you read the Minor Prophets, there's a lot in there about the injustices that the wealthy, wealthy committed upon the backs and the heads of the poor. There's different ways to make money. There's honest ways to make money, and there's abusive ways to make money. But I'm going to read, if you have Amos open, go ahead and leave that open, but I'm going to read you from James 5 an example of how some of the people would make their wealth then, and it's not very different from how some people make their wealth now. James chapter 5, come now you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are rusted, and their rust will be a testimony against you, and you shall eat your flesh as fire. You have laid up your treasure in the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who mowed your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cries out. And the cries of them that reaped have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived delicately on the earth. You have taken your pleasure. You have nourished your hearts in the day of slaughter. That's not honest gain. And there's a lot of people today that get their money by taking advantage of people that don't have money. And so here, they're getting all this profit and stuff, and then they're hiring these people to work out there in the sun and mowing their fields and stuff, and then at the end, they withhold the pay. I've got contractor friends. If anybody's in here a contractor, see if this rings a bell with you. There's a rich person, and he hires you for a job, right? And you agree upon a price. Here's the price, right? And you work, and you work, and you work, and you work, and you get done, and then what does he do? He starts looking for something to complain about. And I'm not talking about a legitimate complaint. You know, if, if you did this wrong, he has a right to expect it to be done right. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the time he was never planning to pay this in the first place. Never planning to pay that. And then he starts picking. I wanted this this way. I wanted that that way. I wanted that. I'm not going to pay you this. And he starts, and he's whacking it down, whacking it down. And what contractors a lot of times just learn, it's like, take what you can get and walk away, and they just never do business with them again. And he, he hires somebody else next time and just keeps abusing people and taking advantage of them. So picture this rich man, and he hires all of you to mow his fields. And then he gets done and maybe says, and just, Yo, where's our pay? Well, now I believe you were drinking from my well water. That costs this. You were losing, using my tools. That costs this. And I found a patch of water, and he... It's just designed. He's, he's, this is partly how he got rich. He's just cheating the laborers under him. 
Listen to this now from Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter, excuse me, let's start with chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this, you cows of Bashan. The cattle there were well-fed cattle. Hear this, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks, and you'll go out through the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you'll be cast into harm, declares the Lord. They're just living in exorbitant luxury. He said, you're going to be taken by hooks and ropes and stuff and taken away captive. Go with me to chapter 5, verse 10. They hate him who reproves in the gate. Amos goes up there and he's preaching against him. Do these rich people want to hear this? With, with their guilt and their oppression and stuff, they're comfortable. They're liking what they got. Do they want to hear him or anybody else say what needs to be said? No. They hate him that reproves in the gate. They abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you won't dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you will not drink their wines. For I know how many your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, who turn aside the needy in the gate. Verse 14. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as you have said. See, they were saying, oh, God is with us. Say, no, no, no. You need to quit your wicked ways. You need to love good and turn from evil so that God will be with you, as you have said. At one point in Amos, he says, why are you asking for the day of the Lord? It's coming, and it's going to be bad. It's like when you're running from the bear and running to the lion, or I might have got that backwards. Keep reading with me in Amos chapter 6, verse 4. Woe to you that lie on beds of ivory stretch themselves out on their couches, eat lambs from the flock, calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, like David infant for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who will go into exile. And of course, what's going to happen? The Assyrians are going to come, and they're going to take these people captive. What happens to that couch of ivory? That's the last time you laid on that. What happened to your bowls of wine? Yeah, you're going to be lucky if you get to drink out of a creek now and then on the way on your march, you know, to Assyria or whatever country they're going to send you off to. We live in a land of great benefit and freedom and liberty. And we can appreciate that, and we can do well here. We can also let it spoil us. I want to share with you a few stories, one from just a couple of weeks, three weeks ago. I was with an older brother down in Florida. He's in his 90s. He lived through the Depression. And I love him. He's an interesting man to talk to. And he shared with me what he got for his sixth birthday. He's in his 90s, and he still remembers what he got for his sixth birthday. He said, I got a boiled egg. He said, I got to play with it. And after I got done playing with it, I got to crack it open and eat it. And in 2021, after all these decades, he still remembers getting that boiled egg. What'd you get for your sixth birthday? I don't remember. Sometimes the more we get, the less we appreciate it. I want to ask you a question. 
Are we raising our children to be giving producers or selfish consumers? And we might ask that of ourselves. Are we giving producers or have we become selfish consumers? When I was in Haiti, if I remember correctly, the first time I went to Haiti in the late 70s, if I remember correctly, average per capita income per year was $80. So I remember eating in a home, dirt floor. Uh, it's, some people lived in stick and mud huts and stuff. Some, one time I stayed in a house that had cinder block. No, no glass in the windows, just they're wanting cinder block there. Uh, the rafters were just sticks from branches, and then there was a tin roof. That was one of the nicer houses in town, the second time I was in Haiti. But the first time, I remember, and like they brought water, it looked like it had been scooped up out of the ditch. It wasn't even very see-through. And they don't have a lot of money. But the second time I was in Haiti, we took our translator to lunch one day. We stopped at a little restaurant and we got lunch. It was like meat and potatoes. It was really good. It cost $3.50 for, for lunch. And I remember the day, it was when the space shuttle exploded. Because while we were sitting there, there was a little TV up in the corner and, and that was happening. But we were sitting there with our translator and when he got done, his plate looked like it hadn't been eaten off of. Because he had, with his bread, sopped up every bit of it. At the end of my time there, my, my other friends had gone back to the States. I was there a little longer. And there was some exciting stuff went on as well, because that's when Baby Doc got overthrown. And there was machine gun fire out in the street. And they came into my room and told me, Scott, you know, the airport's been closed down and everything. But then it opened back up, and I was able to go home when I needed to go home. But during that time, I, I took the translator back downtown. I needed to go downtown and buy some things, some Bibles or something. I asked him to go with me, and he went with me. And I said, hey, I said, let me buy you lunch again. And this is what he said. So he, he lived in an apartment not a lot bigger than this stage. There was a room, and there was a room. And he had electricity. There was an extension cord that came in. He had a hot plate and a light bulb maybe two light bulbs, and a cassette player, I remember. And I said, I'll, I'll, let me take you out to lunch. I was going to go to the same place. He said, Scott, he said, I really appreciate that. I really enjoyed it the other day. He said, that's the only time in my life I've ever eaten at a restaurant. He said, I really enjoyed it. But if you don't mind, could you just give me the money that you would have spent for the lunch? Because that would help me to buy groceries for me and my sister and help pay the electric bill. <laughs> of course I did that. But. I'm going to tell you something. In this country, we have confused wants with needs. I'll get calls from people saying, oh, I need, I need this and I need this and I need this. And I'll go over and there's somebody sitting smoking cigarettes in the middle of the day watching cable TV. You know, I didn't have cable TV. <laughs> I wasn't paying for cable TV. They had it. We're mistaking wants for needs. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6? Don't worry. You'll have food and clothing. Did he say you'll have food and clothing and a jet ski and air conditioning and indoor plumbing and, you know, uh, a brand new... No! He said you'll have food and clothing. We're going to end the lesson in a few minutes with a text that says we're supposed to be able to be content with food and clothing. Do you remember what Jesus said to the rich young ruler? He could see what was important in his heart, and what did Jesus say to him? Sell everything you have and come follow me. Would you be willing and he said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Jesus wanted a televangelist. <laughs> he wanted to say, sell everything you have and give it to me. He said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. What if Jesus came to you down here 
and picked you out of this crowd or me out of this crowd and told me or you, you sell everything you've got and give it to the poor. Would you do it? Think about that for a minute. Would you do it? Or would you walk away sorry? But that's my stuff. That's, that's my truck. That's, that's my lake property. That's my vacation home. That's my big screen TV. That's my... Was the rich young ruler wrong only because Jesus spoke to him, or was he already wrong? He was already wrong. Jesus, looking on him, loved him, challenged him over what he knew the man's problem was. By the way, Jesus didn't tell everybody to do that. Zacchaeus was a rich man. Jesus didn't tell him to give away everything. That wasn't Zacchaeus' problem. But that was the rich man's problem. I want to share a couple of other stories. In the Czech Republic, Mike Marr and I were invited over to a couple's house. They were agnostics, but they met Mike, and they invited us to dinner. And they said, come over, and we'll have dinner, and then we'll go for a walk. By the way, when you go for a walk after dinner with Czech, sometimes it's a three-hour hike. You know, it's, so be prepared for that. But uh, it was nice. It was really nice. While we were there, they had a nice apartment. Um, they, I want to paint both sides of this picture so you get an actual, actual thing. Nice, clean apartment. Um, they had a nice meal. There was no scarcity of food on the table. It was delicious. But as we talked, some of the things became clear. They, told, they recommended a restaurant to us. They said, you have to try the India restaurant on Wenceslas Square. They said, it's our favorite restaurant. We go there once a year. And then one of them remembered that last year they didn't. You know why they didn't go last year? Remember, once a year they go. They didn't go last year because the price went up $1.50. So they didn't go. Checks were really responsible with their money. Nobody had much, and your neighbor didn't have much, and you had to do with what you had. Now, they could do some nice things. The whole family went on vacation to Switzerland. So they think, wow, yeah, they're really well off. Somebody once said, it's not whether or not you, I've forgotten how it goes. It's something about, it's not important getting what you want as much as wanting what you've got. So they went with their girls to Switzerland, but this is how they did it. His job, which was in computers, and her job was in computers, one of them had a connection with the railway, and so they could get discount tickets. So they got on the train with their discount tickets. And going from a country to country over there is like from state to state here. Czechoslovakia was the size of North Carolina. And they got over there, and how would they afford the hotels? Well, they didn't. They slept out in the park. How would they afford the restaurants? Well, they didn't. They took bread with them from Prague. The Czechs, when they would go places, sometimes they would sew a tent for themselves. You know, it's, they didn't go spend money because they didn't have it. But they still enjoyed the nature and the science. She happened to mention, she said, every once in a while, I, my daughters really like bell peppers. They had two girls. She said, every once in a while, I will buy one bell pepper and let them split it. But they couldn't do that very often because bell peppers were expensive. We went for our hike. And on the way back, she asked Mike and me, she said, because she had, she worked, he worked, she made about 1500 a year, he made about 1500 a year together they had a total income of 3000 for the whole year. But she didn't get to have much time with her children because she worked full time. And as we got back toward the apartment, she asked me, Mike, she said, do most women mothers in America work outside the home? And Mike said, yes, they do. She said, why? She said, do they do it? Because they have to, 
or because they want to. And then she said, I do it because I have to. But I wish I could be home with my girls. It's a pretty valid question. I want to show you a couple of biblical texts. They're both important. The first one shows that the worthy woman was a productive woman that helped bring income into the family. There's nothing wrong with a woman making money and helping the prosperity of the family. The worthy woman did that. But I want you to look how she did it. And then I want to look at Titus 2. And I want to challenge us to think about whether or not we're taking our cues from our culture or from the Word of God. First, let's look at the worthy woman, Proverbs chapter 31. There's three women in Proverbs. There's Sophia, wisdom personified as a woman in the beginning, trying to get people's attention, they won't listen. There's the adulterous woman over in chapter 7. And there's the worthy woman in Proverbs 31. Let's listen to her. An excellent wife, Proverbs 31, verse 10, an excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax, works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it's yet night, provides food for her household, portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses her health with strength makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hand to the staff and her hands to the spindle. So she's working and she's making garments. She sees a field, she buys it, she plants a vineyard. And her household is going to be dressed in scarlet, but she's not just helping her household. She's also helping the poor. She opens her hand to the poor. She reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, delivers sashes to the merchants. To the merchant. Strength and dignity are clothing. She laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many women have done exceedingly, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Clearly, this worthy woman improves the financial ability of the home. She's made money, she's, she's, she's industrious, she's contributed to the well-being of their home, and they're dressed well. They, they've got quality. But it's not like the rich fool who it's all for him. She's taking care of her family and help taking care of the poor and the needy. Contrast that with Titus chapter 2. We use the expression sound doctrine, right? You know where the Bible, one of the places where the Bible mentions sound doctrine? It, in, in Greek, that's just healthy teaching. Look at it in Titus chapter 2. Here's some sound doctrine. Look at it and read it with me, please. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Brethren, doctrine is not just about what we do when we worship in assembly. Doctrine is not just about theology, about what we believe about redemption in the nature of God. Doctrine is not just about how we are to use the Lord's money. Doctrine 
teaching includes how we live day to day on Monday and Tuesday through the, through the week in our homes and in the community. Look what this text says about sound doctrine. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men, for those of us that are older men, I'm one, some of you are the same. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, some of you are older women, listen to sound doctrine. Older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women, younger women, this is sound doctrine for you, to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive, to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Then, young men, likewise urge young men to be self-controlled. And to Titus, show yourself, who may be a young man, in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, etc. This doesn't mean she can only be at home. The, the worthy woman What'd she do with those garments? She took them to the tradesmen and she sold them. And then they'll sell them elsewhere. How'd she find that field and buy it? She went and did that. She went and planted it. She's not all the time in her home, but where was that worthy woman focused? Was her life focused on a full-time career way out there somewhere? Or was her uh, work focused on her home and taking care of her family and taking care of the poor? We have developed a system in this country where we expect husbands and wives to both give full-time careers, and then when a baby is born, it gets dumped in a daycare center. And you are not going to find somebody that will love your child and give your child the time it needs that you should be giving by turning it over to somebody getting paid minimum wage, trying to watch 30-something kids. My daughter got married early last year and just recently had a little baby boy. She was working before she got married. She was working after she got married. And now she's busy taking that little boy. His name's Ray. We call him Stingray. And there is not a job in Adams County more important for he to be, her to be doing right now than taking care of that little baby boy. And she is fit to take care of that little baby boy. God made her to be able to take care of that little boy. We live in a country right now where people pretend that there's not different roles for men and women. There are. My dad likes to put it this way. He said, what's better, a fork or a spoon? Depends on what you're using it for. You know, some things a fork's better, some things a spoon better. If you're eating soup, forks aren't much good. God made men with special capabilities, and he made women with special capabilities. I couldn't bear a child if I wanted to. I can't nurse a child. God created women to be able to do that. And when you look at the curses, although, and don't get this idea that this is the man singing, and this is one thing. There's not overlapping and co cooperation. I had a friend of mine that said, I never changed a diaper. Well, shame on him for that. You know, change diapers, guys. You know, help out and stuff. But there's a general role that you see it in the curses. The curses on the woman related to what? Her children and her husband. The curses on the man related to what? By the sweat of your brow, you'll be providing you know, and, and working and fighting the thorns and the thistles and stuff to provide. You'll cooperate and you'll overlap, but we're not both men. We're not both women. And the genders are under attack in so many ways with such nonsense now that we've got places where a man can put on a dress and he's supposed to be able to go into the public restroom where your daughter is. 
and we're, we're, we're tolerating insanity on what's actually real. In the Bible, God, what does it say? He created them male and female. That's a good thing. I would not want to live in a world that's just us men. And it would not be real good if it was just women. And if it was just one or the other, it would be the last generation. Male and female is God's idea. And when you look at the Bible, in the Old Testament, they were to dress different. Men don't wear women's clothing. Men don't wear men's clothing. The hair length is different. 1 Corinthians 11. The roles in the church are different. 1 Timothy 2, 1 Corinthians 14. The roles in the home are different. There's an exercise I do with young men in the summer sometimes because I'll, I'll often be talking to a bunch of teenage boys and we'll take one of the boys. I'm going to wrap up here in a minute, but I'm going to go just a few minutes over time if you'll bear with me. And I'll take one of the teenage boys, I'll ask for a volunteer, and we put him up front, and we say, all right, we're going to progress you and go through your next few years of life real quick. And so we'll take one of the boys up here, we'll say his name's Jaden. And I say, all right, now he's graduated high school, we'll do the pump and circumstance, now you graduate, you go to college, what are you going to major in? He goes, you know, architect, or whatever he picks. Okay, and then now he gets a girlfriend, somebody give a name, somebody says, Maria, okay, he's engaged to Maria. What's she studying? He, uh, he picks out something, you know, for her, oh, he's an engineer or whatever. Okay, and then we graduated from high school, and now they get married, da, 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 da. now they're married. And I said, now, how much money are you making? And sometimes their estimates are way off, sometimes they're accurate, but he says, I'm making this much. How much is she making? She's making this much. I said, okay, this much and this much, you got this much money. Start buying stuff. What do you want? What kind of car do you want? Oh, he wants a Mustang. What kind of car does he got? Oh, she's going to have this, you know. And what else are you going to get? Oh, I want the big screen. And I let him buy the house and buy all the stuff. And then all of a sudden I go, wah, wah, and I hand him a baby. And he goes, I said, who's going to take care of that baby? One goes, Grandma? I said, Grandma didn't have that baby. Now listen, if you live close to Grandma and you're in a situation where it's helpful and not a burden on her and stuff, and you can work things out in your family, that's one thing. But that baby's not grandma's responsibility. Who's going to take care of that baby? And he starts thinking about it. That baby's hungry. <laughs> you know, that baby needs somebody. I knew a lady who was running daycare. She was trying to run a daycare better than the daycare she'd worked at before. She said the daycare where she worked at before, she said she wasn't even allowed to hold the babies. She said babies would sit there hour out banging their head, just banging their head, and said, don't hold them, it'll spoil them. So one of her jobs was to crayon pictures to show the parents, oh, look what your little child did. And one of her jobs one day was one of the daycare uh, people had hit a baby and left their face bruised, and they said, when the parents come, tell them that the kid fell off the slide. I could tell you some more horror stories about sexual abuse and things at daycare that I'm not going to go into. From friends of mine that run a daycare, and they love those kids and they're trying to do a good job, but you're, you're caring for a number of kids and you don't always know what's going on. Children need their mom. And so, who's going to take care of that? And so, well, somebody needs to stay home with the baby. I said, what about all these bills? Because what did we just do? We just spent all their double income, and now we got all these bills. Years ago, my friend David Hartzell, many of you will know him, he, and different families operate different well. There, there's jobs where you can be very centered in your home. There's jobs where you'll be away from your home some, but you'll be around your home mostly when your children need you. There's jobs where you can help handle more than one thing at once. But let me tell you something, statistically, historically, you know when most teenage pregnancies, at least in the past, have occurred, the conception, between 3 and 5 p.m. You know why? Kids are home and no parents are there. When I've listened to young teenage men tell story after story after story after story about how they got hooked on pornography and it goes to some really ugly places sometimes, besides the ugliness it starts with, they'd get up and they'd tell this story, well, I was at home alone. I was at home alone. I was at home alone. I was in my room with the cable TV. I was... Our kids need us. And our homes are more important 
than our houses. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than fattened ox and hatred with it. Proverbs 17, 1. Better is a dry morsel with a quiet house and a house full of feasting and strife. Listen, if you can have a really nice house and a really great family and serving God and great kids, enjoy that blessing. I really enjoyed the, the, the cabin I was in tonight. It's magnificent. I love it. I really like that. But if you're in a situation where you have to choose time to spend with your family, and, and be working for God, or you have to give that all up for a nice place, give it all up. If you look at John Wilkes Booth House in the place where Abraham Lincoln was born, where Abraham Lincoln was born was a dump. John Wilkes Booth grew up in a really nice house. It didn't make him a better person. I, you have met a lot of people, a lot of people, who are messed up today because they grew up in a bad home right? How many people have you known that are messed up today as an adult because they grew up in a bad home? How many people you know that are messed up today because they grew up in a 1950 house with an avocado green washer and a white wash, you know, white washing machine, dryer and washer don't match, you know, in shag car. No, that didn't mess people up. Again, if you can have both, enjoy it. Job would have had a nice house. You know, Abraham would have had a nice tent. The worthy woman, they would have had a nice place. And they were dressed in linen and purple. It's not wrong to do well. But it's wrong to put that ahead of God and put that ahead of our families. Amen. So in winding up, the, I was going to tell you about the story about David Hartzell. He was called to help this family because it was a mess. The kids were doing badly in school. The family wasn't getting along well. Both mom and dad come in after long hours. They don't have time for each other. They don't have, she doesn't have time to make much of a meal. They don't have time to work with the kids. Doesn't have time for the husband. Just exhausted, exhausted, exhausted. And things are tense and going bad. And David said, well, it sounds like a lot of this is because you don't have enough time for the family. Have you considered, you know, giving up or maybe cutting back or whatever, or giving up the extra income of the job? And they went, what? And give up all this? We need to think about what our this is. It's not wrong to be wealthy. It's not wrong to have good things. But don't be selfish with it. And don't mistake what the family possesses as being more important than the family itself. We'll close with 1 Timothy chapter 6. And again, the reminder, how are we training our children to be giving producers or selfish consumers? And I'm sorry I've gone, well... Paul said, I regret it, but I don't regret it. I'm sorry that I didn't get this in more concisely, but I do want us to read 1 Timothy 6 together. This is a challenge to me and to you because I don't know how easily I content I would be with absolutely nothing but food and clothing, but we need to get used to it. And you know what? With the foolish things going on with financial, you know, things in the world and the country, we may end up having our own Assyria moment and this all be not ours anyway. So we may have to end up finding out what it's like. First Timothy chapter 6. Godliness with contentment. I'm in verse 6. We'll close with this text. And after this we'll stand for the invitation song. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world. And we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money. Money serves a purpose and it can be used for good. But a love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with unmeaning pains. Verse 17, and compared to the standards of people in the first century, many of whom were servants or slaves, you and I are the rich. So let's listen to what it says about the rich. As for the rich, listen to the three things that we close with. 
As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. We shouldn't think that we're better than somebody else because we've got more money than them. Nor to have their hopes set on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Don't be ashamed to enjoy what you've got, but don't make it your idol. Don't sacrifice your family for it. And don't, don't be the goats on the day of judgment. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. <laughs> don't do that. Because verse 18, and they are to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And there's so many people here like that. There's so many of you that know you're like that and you know the brethren around you are like that. You've done well and you're generous and you share. Remember Ephesians? Thief, stop stealing. Work, take care of yourself and give to those that have need. Thank you for bearing with me as I went over time. And thank you for sharing these things from the word. Let's stand. thankful that we've had this opportunity to come hear another lesson from your word. We're thankful for a brother that brought the lesson to us. We're thankful for his knowledge and his experience in preaching the gospel for the many years that he's been involved in that, his service to thee. We're so thankful for this lesson and we pray to Heavenly Father that we'll, we will help have better understanding of how we are to live in this life so that we might have eternal life. We need to learn how we treat others and not to be selfish and not to be covetous of things in this world because they are all vanish away. And what's left, we will have a home in heaven with thee if we have lived 
like we should and strive to help others to, and to spread the gospel to others and have our the proper love and compassion that we need to have for our fellow man. We pray that you would be with Brother Smelter as uh, he has one more night in this meeting. Pray that he'll have a safe trip home when he leaves back to his family. And bless those who have been mentioned as being sick and in need of, of help and prayers. Pray that you would be with them. This is our prayer in Christ's holy name. Amen.